Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to What's Next, the fireside chat where we bring startups, mentors, industry experts, members of our ecosystem to talk about innovation. Uh, my name is Giovanni Vacari. I am head of product here at Startup Bootcamp, and we have been very busy in the past months. We have been busy building our latest program. It's called Startup Bootcamp Sustainability. And I can't talk about sustainability without introducing to you the upcoming program director for Startup Bootcamp Sustainability and my partner tonight, Hank John. Hi, Hank John. Welcome. Thank you, Gio. Thank you. Well, as you know, I started my corporate career in the traditional world. Then I made my switch to, you know, creating my own startups and solutions. But what is the bridge to start a bootcamp that a lot of the technology that I used came from the startup bootcamp alumni. So that was perfect. So then I became a, a, a corporate partner at uh, startup bootcamp via a local bank in South America and started inventing, creating startups in-house for them using, you know, the startup bootcamp formula and technology. So for me, it was a very easy transition to go from a corporate partner to an entrepreneur in residence, creating startups. Then I started mentoring, which I loved it. So when I moved back to Europe, for me, it was almost like a logical thing to become program director at Startup Bootcamp in the sustainability domain, and I love it. Well, you're more than welcome. We're very happy, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you. And today, we're going to be talking to two very dear alumni uh, from our ecosystem. We're going to be talking uh, to Tradler, and that's who I want to invite first, Jasper from Tradler. Tradler is a SaaS for improving employee engagement, experience, and provides leaders and managers with valuable insights. It helps you recognize daily contributions and help you have happier employees. And for that, I have Jasper. Jasper, welcome today. Well, how are you doing? I'm, I'm, very, I'm very impressed with your introduction. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I had a little bit of a note. I'm not going to lie. Okay, How are you enough. doing? Everything good on your end? Yeah, no, very good. Uh, very good on, on my end. Thank you for having me, by the way, Gio. Sure thing. Thank you for coming. I have to start with, the, of course, the most obvious question, but tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and how did you create Traveler? So um, it, it actually, it all started with the mailman. Uh, and uh, the mailman is my dad. Uh, so four years ago, uh, my dad, he went on, on retirement. Uh, and he, he used to work in, in deep post as a mailman. And when I asked him, so my background is in psychology, right? So completely different. But when I asked him, like, what do I need to look forward to in this thing that we call a career? Um, I mean, for those who know Belgians, you will appreciate the, the sarcasm and the, the positivity in his response, because he basically said absolutely nothing. Uh, if, if anything, <laughs> maybe retirement. And I, I, I found that so sad uh, that I, I went on a mission with Trevor to go and celebrate people their work. And today we call them essential workers, but we go and celebrate the work of the people that we normally don't celebrate as often as they deserve. Right? So those are the mailman, those are your logistic workers, those are people in your call centers. Uh, and so that's a little bit how we started. Right, to solve that that um, that gap in appreciation. And I mean, bridging that gap is now as well very important, uh, especially during this you know pandemic times. And I think that has changed a lot. And and work culture and employee engagement becomes a, a very turning point, right? It can be life or death for companies all around the world. And I wanted to ask a little bit: How does that tie up with the traveler mission? And how does traveler change the work environment and shape? and better shape this relationship uh, between uh, employer and employee. And yeah, so that's, uh, it's not an easy, right? It's not something that we do on a Sunday afternoon with the, with the croissant. Um, no. I've enjoyed that, but that's not, how, that's not how we do it. So it's a, it's a great question. So if you, if you think about first about where we focus, uh, so we really focus on those blue collar workers, um, mainly in logistics. And if you look into what changed for those people during the pandemic is well, packages and parcels, they exploded. Right? So those people were suddenly required to do more work than they already were doing. Uh, there were more stress on them. Suddenly they were called essential workers. Uh, first time I heard the term, the term essential worker was actually in Belgium with my dad. He had a, he had a good giggle about that. Um, but <laughs> the, the, the change here is that the distance that was already there, right? Your mailman is already on the street, but that distance suddenly became even exploded. Um, 
And, and if you have that distance going on, if you have that distance in your organization, you, you start seeing things like uh, lower quality of service. You start seeing things like churn, absenteeism. Um, and so what, what we do with Treadler is we, we celebrate, like you said in your introduction, right? So we celebrate people, their daily work. Uh, so if I'm Yap, the mailman, we go and celebrate the fact that you delivered that letter not just once, but the fact that you do that every single day. And what we take is we do the, the work of those people, we go and celebrate in a relevant and meaningful way. Because in, I, in the end of the day, we're also people, right? Everyone likes to be appreciated for the work that they do. And a simple thank you actually is sometimes missing. Right? So that's the, the gap yeah. that we fill. It goes a long way. Recognition uh, goes, goes a very long way. And talking about things that are going to go a long way, we keep hearing experts saying that there will be a turnover tsunami expected once the pandemic ends, right? More people out there in the open. So with Tradler, you've been focusing specifically on essential workers and, or blue collar employees. Do you see this tsunami affecting them as well on the post COVID experience? Yeah, so I, I think the, the question here, I mean, will people, uh, the, the simple question is, will people leave more often now that, that we're going back to this thing that we call normal? And I think the answer uh, it will be yes, and there will be different reasons for that, right? So one of the reasons could be, well, I was already planning on leaving the organization, but COVID happened and there was a lot of news, people being laid off. So I, I chose to, for the stability, and I stayed in my organization. Uh, another reason might be what we are now seeing a lot is, well, we now went to remote working, I worked from home, uh, and my manager, which was okay, uh, is now micromanaging. Uh, and every single day I'm in 15 Zoom calls with this person where he goes and watch everything that I do, and it's really annoying. Um, it might be about expectations, right? So I expected my organization to, to work in a different uh, way or to, to act in a different way during the pandemic, and they didn't. So, I mean, there will be, there's, there's multiple reasons to why uh, why people might change, why that tsunami might be there. Um, and what, what a lot of the organizations don't, I think, not realize 100%, uh, and that's, that's what we have the conversation with some of those, is that they're like, well, yes, but now it's okay, right? So, of course, now it is okay, now you're having less churn, but if you would fast forward about 18 months, or let's say two years, the problem that existed already before will return and yes, you will have an initial peak, right? Because you have that delay. Um, yeah. So then the, the second part of that question was, so how do you address that? Well, I mean, I, I'm, by no means I'm, I'm the expert, right? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna come off of that. Treadler is just a way in how you can do that. But what we, what we bet on is on meaningful connections at the right time with the right people. And so if you look into those target organizations that we work with, so those kind of like logistic organizations, they have um, a trend which is span of control. Uh, so typically you would see one person managing 50 to 100 people. But so in order to have their meaningful connection, it becomes really hard. And so that's not only now the case in that, in that large organization, that's also when you're working remote. So I think the key here to, to reduce that is by any means, right, uh, is, is to, to create meaningful connections and to create alignment uh, within the organization. Well, awesome. You answered even my upcoming question. So I'll just hand over <laughs> to Hank Jung because I know he also has I burning know, questions know, for you. Very good, Jasper. You, you are one question ahead of us, but that's, that's very good. I mean, you talked about the, the, the challenges and you picked up a few solutions, great. When I worked in, the, in this domain in South America, I was focused a lot on... on you know, poverty alleviation and, and economic empowerment. And we saw trends coming. We saw technology not disrupting, but actually helping because we could, we could connect to people in the interior who actually lived in the Amazon. Uh, in your case, the technology, do you see disruption or do you see uh, support? Yeah, so, I mean, that, I think that that question is depending on which perception you take. Um, because I mean, there's always two sides of the story on that one. Um, but if we, if we look a little bit into the overall trend, 
right? And so the overall trend is part of automation. Um, now, what that means is you take certain administrative work, right? Either from an HR function or any other function, you automate that, but what you really are doing is you're freeing up time of that HR manager, of that HR business part, of, of whoever that is. And so what, what I'm more, I mean, what I'm seeing as like the support of technology is it's kind of transforming the role of frontline managers or HR managers from being this administrative role, right? Like payroll or whatever, to moving more into a coaching role, right? Or having that, that space and time to actually go and, and connect with those people, whether that's then go and connect with people like from a geographical point of view or whether that's really on a personal point of view. Uh, and so that's, in, in that way, I see it supporting. Now, obviously, you could also make a counter argument that is disrupting and it's, it's I, you can make both arguments. Yeah, yeah, true. I gave you, I gave you the positive side of my story, but it, it, it also had a negative side. But if, if we step out a little bit, like zoom out and you look at the social space itself, entrepreneurs who want to be involved in the social sector, do you have specific advice for them? Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> so what we what we started with is I think is a very very positive like optimistic point of view, um, and what we quite rapidly came to realize is that solely for the social reason it is very hard to create change, uh, and so what we did what we realized quite early and what was then also one of the reasons that we were able to replicate quite fast is if you are able to link the social to a business reason. Uh, or, I mean, that can be financial, that can be transformational, it can be any reason, right? But link it to um, some kind of outcome, whether that's then governmental or from a company. But if you can link it to something that has priority right now that they are actively pursuing because of an, another reason, then the social layer has much more chances of success, right? So for us, for example, from the employee side, simply saying, hey, your organization is going to have happier people, they're going to be more recognized, they're going to feel better. I mean, yes, right, we would all agree that that's important. But if you're linked to that, hey, and by doing that, you will have less churn and you save on your onboarding and your recruiting. Well, now suddenly you have something that they are willing to move on to. So my, my advice would be, try to dig, well, not try, but dig until you can find the actual almost pain that you're solving with it. Try to, to dig until you have something that is actually worthwhile for them to do it right now, rather than saying, oh, yes, no, this sounds like an absolutely wonderful thing that we want to do somewhere in 2035, right? So. Okay, okay, so, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Okay, uh, back to Tradver. If we look beyond the next two to five years, what developments are planned on your side? Uh, so we're, we're working on something that we know we now call computer aided management. Um, so what we do is we, I mean, we are already working with different organizations, for example, in Netherlands with PostNL. Um, and what we do there is we measure how can we best engage and support people to achieve their goal. Uh, now, computer aided management or our genie um, is actually using something that we now call uh, collective intelligence. So it is learning from all those organizations how to best give the right trigger to the right person at the right time to deliver, I mean, better engagement to those organizations. So we're, we're now heavily focused on bringing that further, making that smarter uh, over time, uh, because we think that that's where the organizations are going to, right? So that 90% of the administrative work to be able to be reduced so we can truly enable those managers and people to become coaches in their own organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sounds great. And I mean, I don't know if you know, but you closed the loop, right? You started at Belgian Post and now we went to the Dutch Post. I know we did. No, no, no. We didn't start with the Belgian Post. Eh? My dad worked at the Belgian Post. No, just I know. Be, no, just no. You started clear. your story with at Belgian Post and you closed it at the Dutch Post. That's very, ah, good. very impressive. I'm going to give it back to Gio. Of course, and yes, first of all, I want to say to everybody that is commenting uh, here in the comment section, either on Hopin or LinkedIn, uh, we see you and thanks for the comments. Uh, we can always, always address them live as well. Uh, but Jesper, if people want to find Traveler, how, where can they find it? How can they collaborate with you? 
Uh, so you can obviously connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Right? So that's uh, Jasper DePay. Um, but obviously you can also go to our website, tradler.co, C-O, uh, not .com, .co. Um, and what we are truly looking for to collaborate is anyone in the incentive space. Right? So if you are a incentive right. platform or incentive aggregator, we would be very interested to talk to you. Um, or anyone in the logistics space, right? anyone that wants to move their organization to a better place to be to be working at, we would be very interested as well to obviously um, connect with you. That is awesome. And we hear from all your clients, of course, that so far the success rate has been pretty awesome. Uh, what was the reduce on churn again for employees? Uh, yeah, so you're referring to, to Scent. Uh, so Scent was able yeah. to reduce the employee churn with uh, 39%. Uh, and that's on 20,000 mailmen uh, in the first six months already. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that was quite good. Well, if you're looking for that sort of change in your company, don't forget to go to Tradler.co. That is Tradler.co. Thank you, Jasper, for taking the time uh, for meeting with us today. Thank you very much, Gio. And uh, thank you. Well, best of luck with the, with the program. Thanks, Jasper. <laughs> That's with him. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Well, our next guest is Guy from Rebelay, and they are an all-in-one solution to profitability, transparency, and sustainability for e-commerce return and overstock. Welcome, Guy. How are you doing? I cannot hear Guy at the moment. Maybe your microphone is not on, Guy. And now you can. Perfect. Now I can. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Guy. <laughs> We're Thanks. doing it live. We're doing it live. That's how it goes. Perfect. How are you, man? Really good. Really good. I'm just getting into the call here. But also, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. Um, sometimes it leads to confusion, so I just rephrase it basically. Um, for everyone, maybe what is really doing so basically we are on a mission to rescue one billion items from destruction by helping e-commerce bring their written item back to the market yeah that's a different way of framing out of it but uh, yeah so um, maybe i can bit uh, give, go a bit deeper on how they came to be so maybe just give yeah. a quick background about myself and also about really itself so um you have to know about me a bit. So I'm from Luxembourg, a bit of context. I'm from Luxembourg. I was growing up in Luxembourg. It's a wonderful country, but Luxembourg has one downside. It's a small country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While I was growing up there, Luxembourg unfortunately didn't grow up with me. <laughs> so I decided to <laughs> jump to a bigger country. And the bigger country was, in this case, Switzerland. So I studied in Switzerland. I made my I deep focused on business model innovation. I was keen on understanding how to revolutionize industries. And during my study there in Switzerland, I was really, really, yeah, I had the, I had the chance that I also was able to participate in a Stanford program called Design Thinking. And out of this context, out of my academia, I actually got in touch with the return problem because back then the company SAP in the US was forming a student team to tackle this massive return problem for the US market. And back then, as AP said, this market is 400 billion US dollar big, and there's no scalable solution out there yet. A huge base of items, a huge pollution is happening. Wow. There's still no solution out there yet. Yeah. So coming back from there, came back to Switzerland. And in Switzerland, I was always keen on making, uh, making things practical. Theory is always nice, but practical things. So I was involved in many student associations, and one of them is called Start Global. And during my time in the board of Start Global, I also got to know my now co-founder, Christoph Müller, which is a successful entrepreneur in Switzerland. And back then, we both met at an event which I organized, <laughs> and he participated as a speaker. Um, and really soon, we understood that we both worked on the same problem, which is retail management. For me, from the context of my studies, but for him on a subjective field, because for one of his companies, he basically had this problem hands-on and he looked for a solution. But why just looking for a solution for himself? Why not trying to find a solution for the whole industry? And that's how we came together. We just decided, hey, this problem is worth solving. It's a huge, huge waste happening there is an impact with business we are doing here. 
So let's tackle this problem and just out of the commitment that we are going to find a solution to this problem, we decided let's start the company. And that was back in 2018. That is awesome because of course, when people return clothes, item, they don't always go back to the market, eh? Exactly. So a huge number of items, just in terms of numbers, 2 billion items in 2019 were sent back in Europe alone, 2 billion items. Yeah. Wow. And, only, and only a fraction of those items are coming back to the market. So yeah, it's, it's, it's just in terms of, let, let's break it down on a daily unit. So um, breaking it down on a daily unit, that would be the equivalent, roughly speaking, of 2,000 trucks fully loaded fully load of items, which are returned every day. That's a lot. That is a lot. That is a lot. I start thinking about all the things I've ordered in this past COVID month. But uh, let's dial back a little bit to the industry reaction. How has it been uh, bringing Rebel A to the market? And what, what has been the reaction uh, to, to such a, an urgent solution? Yeah, so maybe I'll also go there a step on how it actually came. So as I told you, uh, we actually started the company just out of the commitment of solving this problem. So our journey started with a design thinking methodology. Yeah, we went to the market and we really tried to understand what is now the core problem of this. What is the core problem? Why is it not needed? Yet? Why is it not solved yet? So we went out on the market. We made our market research. We interviewed our stakeholders. We really soon realized it's not just a company problem, but it's basically a whole industry problem. The industry is operating in an old industry logic, yeah, which is working fine, but with a lot of inefficiencies. And those inefficiencies were now to be changed. And that's actually where Regula came in. We understood the industry logic has to change. So let's change the logic and now build the system around it so we can support this new industry logic. Uh, so found the market maybe then. So we went then with a the solution, went live on the market just one and a half year ago. And right now we have more clients knocking on our doors than we actually can operationally um, operationally handle. That is awesome! Congratulations. I hope Starter Bootcamp uh, had a had a had a hand at, in that, um, helping Rebel A achieve it. And uh, talking about you know NCs helping Rebel A, we are talking about e-retail, and that is um, uh, sustainability in that field can also depend a lot on governmental policies. So how has that been for you guys and how significant has that been governance and government impact on, on this industry? Yeah, that's actually a really excellent question in our case because it's a quite relevant topic. Um, also, the politics understood that the industry is not changing by itself Yeah, because the industry, they are always working economically and it's economically more viable right now to destroy items than bring them back to the market because there was no alternative solution out there yet. Yeah. So Rivoli obviously um, is, is one of those solutions. <laughs> but um, in terms of change of policies, so what we really like is policymakers, especially in the European Union, uh, France, but also Germany, they came out with, an, with an, a new circular economy act. Not a new, but just a re, remodeling of the circular economy act. And especially in Germany, there's an, a law called Kreislauf Wirtschaftsgesetz, and there's a clause in it called Obhutspflicht. <laughs> and basically, the Obhutspflicht... Makes sense. Makes a lot yeah, of sense. I thought so. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I thought so, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you understand those names? Kreislauf Wirtschaftsgesetz? Yeah, it's like a typical long German word combining a lot of multiple different words in one. Yeah. <laughs> But what are what are they about? Uh, for, for those who do, for those who didn't <laughs> get it, we speak yeah. German. But for the audience who doesn't, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let me explain a bit. So um, what is actually all about? So this Obhutspflicht in its core says that an e-commerce is not allowed anymore to destroy a return item. It has just the potential to bring this item back to the market. It has the potential to bring it back. Yeah, and we really have the claim: if we can bring it back to the market, then no one else can. So basically, every German e-commerce would need to work together with us if this law would be practical. And that's the downside of it. Yeah, it's a wonderful law, wonderful law. But right now, unfortunately, the, um, it, it's not in practice. Or it's not practically working the way they intend to do it. So um, there should need to be some changes. And those changes need also to come from industry players like us, that they actually have a practical solution to this law. 
we just finished talking to Jasper, who was talking a little bit about all these delivery uh, deliveries coming in. But now, of course, not all of them uh, stayed at their happy places. Uh, a lot of them were returned. How did you see the impact of COVID on orders and returns? And how did Rebel A respond to it? Yeah, there's uh, in terms of trend there. Yeah? So in terms of trend, obviously, the, the volume just increased, increased drastically. Um, so a lot of people who weren't even knowing about e-commerce now also tapped into the e-commerce and did their online orders. So the overall volume of, of returns also increased with it. But a good, a good indication here is that the other uh, metric, so in the other metric, the return rate per person actually dropped down. And that's because new players or new buyers entering into the e-commerce field, they are more cautious about what they buy. And therefore also they are more cautious about what they return. So um, that's a good sign. Yeah, so the people are getting more cautious about what they buy, therefore also return less. Yeah, okay, but I mean, you, you talked about the, the industry logic a few, a few minutes ago, or, 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 you know, the lack of logic. We talked about yeah. governance, we talked, of course, about Rebel A, how you can fit in this whole, this whole uh, flow. But I mean, let's go back and look at the e-tailers themselves. I mean, from, from your opinion, I mean, what can they do to make this whole return policy thing more sustainable before it even reaches your your part perfect so so my here, here might be a contradicting answer from my side i feel the e-tailers mission should always be to focus on the end consumer yeah what does the end consumer wants first an end consumer wants to have a seamless return process which also means free returns that's the industry standard and it's also just fair to offer it because an end consumer, they just can't touch an item up front. And if they then touch it and they realize it was not what they expected, they also should be able to return it again. Yeah? So that's the contradictory part. I actually say make returns free for end consumers, but it's not about that. It's basically what do you do with the returns afterwards? What happens now once the return is happening? And there has to be a change of mind. So a lot of e commerce right now, they feel it's better to have to destroy the items because it's economically viable. Yeah, it's more economically viable, so they destroy those items. So what happens, what needs to happen here is that they shift their minds and also focus on the responsibility of rescuing those items and bring them back to the market and therefore also reduce the, the, the pollution coming with it. OK, OK, Make, makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. Take, taking a step back, I mean, basically what you're doing is you're running an, 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 an impact driven business. I mean, it's, it's not non, non-profit, but it's, it's impact driven. Do you see any specific challenges as an, as a social entrepreneur, for instance, in the field of, let's say fundraising? Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, it's, it's a quite good question. Also a really extra question because um, we, we just recently closed our fundraising and, and the, the way we did it. So we fundraised in the U S but also in the European market. So I can give you a bit of differences here. Yeah. Sure. Um, if you go to the U S <laughs> Uh, the investors look at impact, impact, yeah? So for impact, they say impact is philanthropy. Impact is in philanthropy, therefore you don't create money, you just consume money, yeah? Which is an absolute, I don't know where they get this definition from, but that's how they see it, yeah? <laughs> for us in Europe, <laughs> impact already got into the minds of the investors that impact also can mean profitable, yeah? And in our case, it's truly true. So we are not only impact driven, but the more items we rescue, the more money we make. Yeah. So uh, what I would, what I, what I, what, what I, for example, had a challenge when I was in the US. So I always got this saying, you can't brand your company as an impact company. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. The investors won't invest in you. Yeah. Here, just a general advice to everyone. Don't listen to those voices. <laughs> stick with your core, stick with your mission, and the right investor will follow. Yeah. That was okay, a okay. That's very, very, that's very good. Wise. Very good advice for people who are planning to go to the US market, which is also, you know, always enticing because it's big and people like to spend and consume a lot. Uh, in your case, whether you want to call it impact driven or not, let's say, let's say that you're a company who stands for environmental change. I mean, you talk out loud, you tell everybody about Rebolet, 
but you know you can only be that if you live that so tell us how these f values are i mean uh, projected internally in the organization yeah i mean like, here i can also can make the reference to jasper so jasper has already a wonderful slogan called happier employees yeah <laughs> so if you talk about sustainability you also have to embody sustainability in the team in the company's core identity and the way we do it actually in, in our company is we have defined a set of fresh values we call them and the s in the fresh values stands for sustainability and every one of our employees gets um, a budget a fresh budget so that they can align to those values of the company yeah sustainability could mean yeah if you want to be sustainable so you also need to take care of your body yeah so you get with a budget you can afford a fitness a fitness um uh, abonnement for example or uh, different examples that's one of the ways yeah um, another way is also in our company for example every one of our employees no matter which rank is participating by one percent of the sales revenues everyone gets a participation on that and the role team decides with the money we get what we should do with it okay okay makes sense makes sense individual but still but still a group okay great you just said something very valuable about the u.s market about using the term impact uh so i'm sure our audience wants wants more advice from that level so looking forward in the near future what kind of trends developments do you see with regards to specifically uh, sustainable e-commerce sustainable e-commerce yeah so um, generally speaking about e-commerce sustainable e-commerce so in in the US already we we see a big mind shift uh, happening also in the fashion industry so a lot of consumers are starting to think about second hand is their first choice instead of new wow. item because it, it's, it's, the fashion industry is also jumping on it. So that's really, really good thing. There's also where we see skyrocketing. Yeah, like uh, if, if, you, if you compare to normal e-commerce, uh, second hand e-commerce is by, by numbers 20 times faster increasing. Yeah, so that's... that's, that's 20 time. times? 20 times. That was a number in 2019. Yeah, so I don't know how it's, it's now, but 2019. It's, it's quite it's quite drastical. Also to know the e-commerce space that actually the, the word for the e-commerce is like still a small smaller market compared to the e-commerce space. Very very impressive numbers. Okay, that, that, that's the market. Rebelay itself. I mean, give us give us uh, your plans for the next two to five years. Next two to five years. That's a long plan. So that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> but I can tell you what we what we would like to achieve in in five years. Yeah. So in five years, we want to be our very own unicorn. In five years, we say we want to rescue one billion one billion items from destruction. So that's the kind of impact driven unicorn we we want to be. Um, that's five years. Long target. A long way to go. But in between, right now. So right now, as we just um, uh, closed our our fundraising. Um, basically, we are looking for people. That's also my shootout. So we, we are hiring. We are having 12 open positions. Um, everyone from e-commerce, from, uh, from um, e-commerce managers, from logistics, rail operations. So we have a quite need for talents in this space. So if you want, um, please reach out to me there. Great, great shout out. You? That was uh, my, my ending question was, what, do you, what are you, what is your shout out? So you're looking for employees, you are hiring. Of course, I just heard you raise some money. So it is indeed time to scale up. Where can they find those specific vacancies? Should they look for Rebel A on LinkedIn? Should they look for, where can people actually find you? Perfect. Like Rebole, um, uh, www.com. Yeah, there you can find us in a general way, but on LinkedIn always. So I'm up for a chat. If you have any questions or further questions, uh, please also hit me up there. I also see uh, our team is writing in the comments there, uh, all, the, all the, the contact details. So thank you guys so much for joining. It was very valuable, this conversation. I appreciate you taking your time. Thank you very much. And also good luck for the program here and also for everyone joining this program. Please, please, impact, impact. Thank nice. you, Guy. Thank you, Thank Guy. you. Well, those were the two startups we had for today. Before I wrap up, I would like to, I mean, make an open call. If you want to be a mentor for a sustainability program, uh, we're looking for mentors. If you are a startup, 
looking to grow your business at an incredible speed. Our applications are also open. And if you want to be a partner of the program, uh, we are also looking for that. So don't forget, uh, you can always go to spcsustainability.com to get in contact with us, uh, to become either a mentor, a partner, or to apply as a startup. Applications are open and you can join the program now. If you're looking for more interesting events such as these, don't forget to follow us on Instagram and all our social, net, all our social uh, media profiles. We are always bringing super awesome events uh, to our ecosystem and we can't wait to see you again in one of them. Thank you, Hank John, for joining me as well. Thank you, Gio, for having me. It was a pleasure and yeah. Yeah, it was great. I just want to add with, you know, uh, with regards to the shout out to the startups applications is open and it closes at July 12th. July 12th. So time is ticking. Apply today. And thank you all very, very much. And we will see you next time. Innovation will save the world that is started with camp.